Now let us continue to part two of our optimal mechanism venture. And this is the optimal mechanism. So it's, uh, I guess to not call it part two optimal mechanism. I'll call it by name. So it's Roger Meyerson's optimal mechanism. Another Nobel Prize worthy contribution to auction theory in particular. So as I said, we will have pretty much the same problem with minor adjustments. We still have one seller acting as a designer of our mechanism. Now let's say that this seller sells one item rather than designing quantity. And the seller has no cost of procuring the item and no valuation for the item, just to make things simpler. We will have one buyer with private valuation given by Theta. Everything's pretty standard. And Theta is now uh, distributed according to some distribution with PDF Phi and CDF F. And it is distributed on some interval with full support from zero to Theta upper bound. The buyer's utility is quasi linear or Euclidean, even. Uh, so it's just theta k minus t. And finally, the, the mechanism that the seller designs consists once again of a menu of k's and t's, but now this menu is infinite. So there are a continuum of items there. There is one pair of k and t for every theta. So here, K is transfer, as usual. And what is K? So if now, yeah, if now we do not have the choice of quantity, we have one item for sale, what is K? Yeah, it's whether the seller gives the item. More generally, it is the probability. It is the probability with which the trade occurs. And so the point that I want to make here with this transition from quantities to probabilities is saying that if all of, both of our players here, so both the seller and the buyer, are risk neutral, these are the same thing. So probability is more or less the same as quantity. And you can take either interpretation of the two. Getting half an item with probability 1 is the same as getting a whole item with probability 0.5. Good, so this is the setup. Now, how do we solve it? We solve it in three simple steps. First of all, you can notice straight away that we cannot just write down the problem like we did before. Why is that? Why is that? Question to you. I mean, we could write it down. Maybe, but we could not solve it the way we did. Why is that? Yeah, so we have a continuum of types. And I'll rephrase the second part. We will have a continuum of constraints. We'll have a continuum of IR constraints. So in continuum is a very large infinity. And we'll have a con continuum times continuum of IC constraints. So a lot, a lot of constraints. You'll spend <laughs> a really long time trying to write them all out. And you'll spend even more time Messing with all the Lagrange coefficients that will arise when you try to solve. So we'll take a slightly different approach. A more familiar approach, for that matter. Uh, you can follow basically the same steps that you did when we were showing revenue equivalents. So in step one, yeah, you can show monotonicity. Meaning that if uh, some theta double prime is greater than theta prime, then this type, theta double prime, should get an item with higher probability. These are weak inequalities, by the way. So once again, this is the same kind of monotonicity that we were messing around with when we were showing revenue equivalence. And I will not even tell you how to show this, because you know it all too well by now. The second step 
is also familiar and it's the step just before the revenue equivalence result. Namely, you can show that the envelope representation of payoffs holds in this problem. So you can show the envelope representation of payoffs. Namely that buyer's utility, UB, from, let me check yeah, how exactly I wrote it. Buyer's equilibrium utility, uh, if he's of type theta, is given by the utility of the buyer of type 0, or any other type, plus the integral from that other type, 0, to theta, of the partial derivative of the utility function with respect to allocation, so with respect to k, uh, with respect to theta, sorry, with respect to theta. So it's just k. So the k of s ds. This envelope representation of payoffs will also hold in our setting, simply because this problem is a special case of the Euclidean setting that we did. So all the results that we approved for Euclidean setting in general still hold here. So we have shown monotonicity, we have shown envelope representation of payoffs, not today, but many, many weeks ago. And as I said three easy steps, so here comes the third easy step. We will now use this envelope representation of payoffs to basically pin down the transfers of all types except for the lowest type. If you write out the expected utility of the seller of the designer, which is the thing that we are maximizing over our mechanism, so we're choosing K and T to maximize this. This expected utility is what? It's just the expected transfer. I guess you can say expectation over theta of T of theta. We know of what T of theta is. We can express it using the utility function. So we can express it in terms of the buyer's of equilibrium utility, capital U, and the allocation k. So this will be exactly theta times k of theta minus utility of the buyer of type theta. So what happens now? You can already guess. What happens now? Tell me. Without picking in the slides. Bingo. We wrote out this envelope representation of payoffs for a reason, and the reason is we're going to use it. So we use this expression of u, b of theta, and we plug this right into that expression. And what we get is the following. So expectation over theta, theta times k of theta. I'll change the order of terms here. I'll write the integral first from 0 to theta of k of s ds minus u, b of 0. And this is where the magic begins. So from this point onwards, we'll be doing manipulations that I cannot justify to you in advance, but that will work. So the lesson here is watch and learn, because that is how you will do it from this point onwards. So firstly, what is an expectation? An expectation is an integral of this expression over types of player of the player over theta so let's write it as such we will have integral from zero to theta bar of theta k of theta guess i will yeah i will split them integral straight away uh phi of theta we need the distribution here, d theta, minus the integral of the integral. So again, the outer integral from the expectation, uh, theta bar, the inner integral from here, from 0 to theta, of k of s ds phi of theta, d theta. 
And finally, the expectation of a constant is just a constant. So we do not even need to write the expectation here. It will just be UB of zero. All right, and uh, you are looking a little bit sour. So what are the questions here? Can anyone ask, ask a question on, on why they're having trouble with this transition? So, okay, just to remind you, math notes were a long time ago. So expectation over theta of some function, f of theta, is just the integral over well, all possible values of theta, big theta, of f of theta times the PDF of theta. Yeah, you take that. That's just it. That is the definition of expectation, you can say, for continuously distributed random variables. Another way you can write it is to have an integral over big theta of f of theta df of theta, where capital F is the CDF of the distribution. So we have this expression with a lot of integrals. We do not like integrals, I assume. So we want to get rid of some integrals at the very least. In particular, this term looks a little nasty with two whole integrals, both over theta, but we have to even use a different letter because theta is already used. So we want to simplify that term in particular. How do we do this? Now, there are two ways to do this. I will show you one. And the textbook by Burgers uh, has another one in it. But I discourage you from using that one, from using Burgers' method, because it seems easier, but it's a lot easier to make a mistake and get confused in that. So what we will do is integration by parts. which, again, sounds intimidating. I know you have not seen it ever since you read my math notes. Uh, but this is a, just a more sure way to do this correctly, I feel like. So let's write out the problem once again, the term that we are trying to simplify. We have two integrals from 0 to theta bar, and then from 0 to theta, of kfs ds. Is phi of theta d theta. <coughs> and to remind you how the integration by parts rule looks like, it looks approximately as follows. An integral from a to b of u dv, where both u and b are functions of some variable, can be given, can be written down as u times b, evaluated from a to b, minus the integral from a to b of v du. But what I want you to do now is, I want you to apply this integration by parts rule to this expression, and I will give, I will even give you the first step on this path. I will tell you that this integral with these brackets will be your u of theta, you can say, and this term is dv of theta. Oh. So use this rule to simplify this expression. And let's say I'll give you five minutes to do so. We can start now. Okay, so let's let's uh, see whether we can handle it. The first thing that I like to do when I have to deal with integration by parts is I have u, I have dv. I just want to write out the du and v explicitly, so the 
two other elements that we are missing. So u of theta, g of theta will be something, and v of theta will be something else. So who can tell me what du is? Drum roll. That's right, yeah. So here, what we are using is we are using another part of math notes that I uh, gave you, which is the Leibniz rule. Yes, Leibniz rule differentiation, that's right. So here, in this function of theta, the only place where we have theta is in this upper limit of the integration. So when this happens, to differentiate that, we end up with the function evaluated at that upper limit, so k of theta. That's right. With dv of theta, things can be sometimes more difficult, right? Because here we have to take the antiderivative of this. So what is v of theta? f of theta. Two out of two. Great. Yeah, because I've, I've told you and raised it that this term can be rewritten as d f of theta. But you can also just recall that your pdf is the derivative of your cdf at a given point. So now we just need to take all of these four terms and plug them into the expression that I just erased. So what shall we have? First, we have u times v. So f of theta times the integral of k of s ds evaluated at theta indeed from 0 to theta bar. Thank you. And then minus the integral again from 0 to theta bar. All of the markers are dead today. Of VDU, so f of theta uh, I guess we should always have some differential that I often keep forgetting. So g of theta will be k of theta d theta. Here we have exactly that, k of theta d theta. Okay, so now we, we are pretty much done. We just need to evaluate that. So this term, this bracket, at theta bar minus at uh, zero. So what is it at theta bar? F of theta bar will be plus one times the integral from zero to theta bar. I'll have to write a little smaller now. Uh, probably. Yeah, it's integral from 0 to theta bar of k of theta d theta. You can write kfs ds, but now that theta is free again, I'd rather use theta. Minus this term evaluated at 0. 0, because f of 0 is 0, because this is the lower bound of our support. That's right. And then the second term is also 0. Because it's integral from 0 to 0, it's 0. So everything is 0. And then we can just leave this integral as is. Integral from 0 to theta upper bar. F of theta k theta d theta. And just one last thing to note here is that we can combine these two integrals into one, which is what I will do when I write that expression back where it belongs. So all of this, all of that integration by parts, long and painful, was to simplify this term. I would say that we have achieved this. Well, let's plug in to make sure. So from the first time we have integral from 0 to theta bar, theta k of theta, phi of theta, 
d theta. Then the second expression that we just obtained, integral from 0 to theta bar of k of theta times 1 minus f of theta. Theta times 1 minus f of theta. Theta. And minus the final term, ub of 0. Cool. Now, we can combine these two integrals as well. And I will do it in maybe a somewhat unexpected way. But it will make sense this time around. So I will take k of theta and the distribution out of the brackets. So what we will have in the brackets will be theta from here minus 1 minus f of theta divided by phi of theta times phi of theta d theta minus ub of 0. This is the final expression. This is the one we're going to be working with from now on. Once again, there is an alternative to integrating by parts. It is in the textbook. But do not listen to the devil, for he will tempt you. Yeah, just many people tried to use that method last year, and they got very confused. So just use integration by parts. So what did this get? Why, why all this mess? What have we got? As I told you, we were doing all this to get rid of the transfers in our expression. Recall what revenue equivalence says. It says that once you pin down the allocations, k, you only have one degree of freedom left for transfers, which is given by this utility of the lowest type. And this is exactly what we did. So we have expressed our expected revenue in terms of just the allocation and the utility of the lowest type. Uh, but there are no transfers left, so instead of trying to select k's and t's at the same time, we only need to choose k's, because then transfers will obtain by the end of the representation of pairs. So we only need to choose k of theta, again, as a whole menu, not just one value and ub of theta. Let's start with this utility of the lowest type, because it is just one value. What pins it down? Uh, what is our constraint on transfers? What stops us from extracting all the transfers in the world? Participation constraint, that's right. So we know that participation constraint for at least some type will bind. And from this analog representation of payoffs, and from the way we wrote our, the formula to our problem, we even know what this type is. In particular, in this problem, k is weakly positive for every player, meaning that this integral is positive if we take 0 as our benchmark type, meaning that utility of arbitrary type theta will be weakly greater than utility of type 0 in a incentive compatible mechanism. This means that we only need to satisfy the participation constraint for type 0. That's right. If we satisfy it for 0, it will hold for every other type because we assume that the outside option is just 0. Therefore, we should increase our transfers until this IR for type 0 binds. 
Therefore, the UP of zero that we are selecting should be set at zero. It's the outside option. So you can now say that we have solved half of our problem. We have selected UP of zero. Now we just need to find the optimal k. And uh, here we can look at this expression and try to find k to, in a way that would maximize. In particular, you can, what we can do is to try to use a very dumb and straightforward approach and to say, you know, we, we have, of course, a lot of k's to choose, but let's employ, employ a kind of a greedy algorithm and choose every k separately, choose every k to, uh, to maximize you know, this expression. So basically, take first order condition of this expression with respect to k, and that's it. No regard for other k's. And what you will end up having is that your choice of k done in such a way will depend on the sign of this term. I will call this term virtual surplus. Given that k is between 0 and 1, and this is in effect a linear problem in k, what you will have is you will want to set k to either 1 or 0, depending on the sign of this virtual surplus. In particular, if it is positive, you will want to set k to 1, or as high as you can, because this will increase this um, part of the integral. So you will want to set it to 1 if, sorry, k of theta, if the virtual surplus of a given type is weakly positive, and if virtual surplus is negative, then increasing k decreases the integral, or decreases this element of the integral. So you want to minimize k. In particular, you want to set k to 0. And again, I'm saying that this is the tie-breaking rule, but the tie-breaking rule can be arbitrary. You can put the equality down here. A natural question arises. What is virtual surplus? What does this term mean? So on the one hand, you do have just the usual surplus that you could extract from a wire of type theta, which is just theta. So this is the maximum amount that this type would be willing to pay for a full unit of the item. So this is the potential surplus of trade. But what is this weird term? What is this second weird term? And this term will represent the cost of incentives. So you can see this term as the cost of fulfilling the IC constraints for type theta. And I know it's certainly not obvious from here, but let us let us uh, take a look back at the monopolistic screen example. There, what we had is the, distort the allocation of the low type was distorted downwards to you know, provide incentives for the high type, to ensure that the high type is not willing to pretend to be the low type, because then he will not only get the allocation of the low type, which was suboptimal back then <coughs> for the high type, but that allocation is worsened even further to provide incentives to the high type. So we had to do it to provide incentives to H. Here, yeah, I guess I misspoke. This is this represents the cost of incentives for the higher types. So by how much we need to distort the allocation for type theta to disincentivize other types from mimicking this type theta. So this is the preliminary intuition about virtual surplus. We will talk about this a little bit in a minute, but uh, for the minute, let's return to this. So is this the solution? Is this the allocation rule that together with this UB of theta 
and the transfers that we can expect from general representation of payoffs. Are all these three terms together giving us the optimal mechanism? Yes or no? And yes, so boring, I'll say no, or not necessarily. Because we are missing one part. We're missing something that we need to check. But can anyone see what do we need to check? Yeah. That's the perfect question. What about monotonicity? We know that K of theta is only implementable, meaning that the mechanism that we just designed will only be incentive compatible if K of theta is monotone, meaning if it is increasing in theta. For this to be the case, we would need that, or it would be sufficient, that virtual surplus of theta is increasing in theta. But this is not necessarily the case, right? You see that this, it looks a little funky. It's not obvious why it should be increasing in theta, or why this term should be decreasing in theta. And the answer is, the answer is it really is not obvious. So for any given distribution, you will have to check whether, you're give, whether the allocation you get is monotone or not whether the virtual surplus in this problem is monotone or not. And again, this is something that depends on the distribution of values, the distribution of times that you're assuming. So if you have a nice distribution and this k of theta is monotone, then we're done. Then we have the mechanism. So in particular, this will be k of theta. This is how you compute it. And then you compute transfers from the envelope representation of payoffs using this k and this ub of 0. Exactly. This is, the, this is an excellent question. The question was, why would we ever want to set k to 0 if the buyer always has positive valuation for the item and the seller has no cost? from uh, selling the item. So the trade is always efficient in this case. And the answer is incentives. So let us try to think, do a quick mental math. What would happen if we just adopted the efficient allocation? So efficient k here is just one for all types, right? You just give the, you always sell the item. But then payoff equivalence implies, or not payoff equivalence, but incentive compatibility constraints imply that your k does not depend in any way on what, which type you report. Therefore, your payment should also not depend on uh, what type you report. So then we should find such a payment that all types would be willing to trade. And in this model, what is this payment? Zero. Because we have buyers whose valuations are as low as zero. So to make sure that we sell to them, we need to set the price at zero. And that would ruin our revenue. So here, what we do instead is we are committing to not sell the item to the low types, those with, um, those with low surplus theta, and those that impose a lot of externality in a sense in terms of providing costs to other types. So those for whom this virtual surplus is negative. And if we do that, we will give more incentives to uh, report truthfully to the highest types. We will be able to extract more with higher payments from the highest types. So there is a slide that systematizes all these take uh, takeaways. But I guess we went through most of them already. And I will not write them down. So just to enlist them, first of all, once again, if uh, this is the optimal allocation, then what happens is we distort the allocations of the lowest types to provide incentive, incentives to higher types. And actually, one thing you can see here is that for the highest type, theta bar, so this term will be zero. 
because f of theta bar is one. So there is no incentive considerations in choosing the allocation for the highest type because nobody wants to mimic the highest type. Nobody wants to say, I would, I'm ready to pay a million for, for, for this item because then you'll have to pay a million. Everybody wants to say, mm, it's not that good. Can you drop the price a little bit maybe, right? Everybody wants to mimic lowest types. That's why we distort the allocations of the lowest types. That's one takeaway. Uh, takeaway two is that allocation of the highest type is undistorted. What else? Yeah, even though games from trades are always present, sometimes you want to not sell to lowest types, uh, same thing. And finally, the distribution of phi matters. Okay, uh, one other thing in relation to this. We just said that if virtual surplus is increasing or uh, yeah, increasing in theta, then this is the optimal location and life is great. What if it's not? What if you have some nasty distribution of valuations that you took from the data, so you cannot just think of some other distribution? And this nasty distribution implies that this virtual surplus is non-monotone. In particular, now let me draw it this here. So you have something like this. I will write a graph that will be illustrative, but which will have nothing to do with this problem that we just solved. So you have some chaos theta that looks like this. And you know, in our problem, it's always one or zero, but again, consider some completely other problem in which pointwise maximization of uh, revenue or any other objective you have gave you this allocation rule. Now, it is obviously non monotone. So what do you do with it? The answer is you pick the closest one to it for some measure of closest. That is monotone. In particular, for this uh, function, the closest monotone thing would be something like this. Right? It's weakly increasing, and it's as close to the original as possible for every point. So then, of course, you would still need to figure out what this level is, because you can shift it up or down. But basically, the costs from allocation being too low here must be exactly offset by the costs of allocation being too high here. And this procedure is called ironing. Because you iron the allocation rule flat. Uh, the question is, can you discipline these, uh, can you infer this level from these areas basically being the same, right? Uh, the answer is not necessarily, because it all depends on your revenue function, yeah. on your objective function, and we don't really know what this is in this problem. And secondly, it just depends on the distribution of thetas, right? Because if you have a lot of thetas here, yeah. and very few thetas here, then this cost feels a lot greater than this cost. So you will need to yeah, just optimize over this level. Yeah. One particular consequence of this ironing procedure is as follows. If you have some weakly decreasing K of theta, this is original theta then what is the closest thing to a weekly increasing k of theta? Just a horizontal line, that's right. So you'll just have some constant allocation, and it will be revenue uh, maximizing, or objective maximizing. But again, you will still need to figure out what exactly is the level at which to fix the allocation. All right, cool. So this is Meyerson's optimal mechanism. Again, you see that it is pretty much the same problem as in monopolistic screen, but the way we proceed about solving it is slightly different. 
but it's still tractable. it gives us very nice prediction and gives us very nice insights with this virtual surface.